With that, I'd like to call on Brian Scheel. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Tino said, I'm a uh, resident of Georgia. This is my office right here. The, um, you know, I, you can see it says world champions. You know, I, I debated whether to put that up there, but I realized, like, it, I guess we're still world champions for another, like, nine hours or so, assuming the uh, Giants uh, win this evening. So, um, you know, one of the reasons I, I really um, enjoy coming here and really was looking forward to it is, is, is I have a real affinity for Georgia having spent the last 15 years, 16 years here. And, um, and really, a lot of it's at the Weather Channel, but uh, I've gotten to know a lot of companies here, and I think a lot of things that we did at the Weather Channel, a lot of things that we're doing at the Red Sox, I, I think you'll have a great appreciation for how they might touch kind of your own businesses as well, and hopefully some of the lessons that we're doing might um, relate to some of the things that you're thinking about as well. So before we begin, just uh, Braves fans. Uh, that's good. Red Sox fans. That's respectable. Yankees fans. Uh, keep those hands up. Uh, security, could you note all the Yankees fans? <laughs> all right. That's okay. It's all, all good for today. So um, I grew up about 12 miles north of here. As Tino said, I was a, um, you know, a big Red Sox fans kid growing up. I, I always wanted to be part of the club, and I, I always thought it would be more on the field, but, um, but this is just as good. And, um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about sort of my journey. I've only been with the organization now for about 14 months and um, a little bit longer as a consultant as well. But, um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about, they're, they're an awful lot like the Weather Channel, which many people are very surprised to hear. But, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about some of those parallels. But more importantly, there are kind of three guiding principles in terms of how we view sort of technology and business and, um, and how we sort of want to evolve our own or our organization. And I'll kind of share some of those with you. So we'll start off with sort of, as Tino said, for all the uh, baseball fans out there, this is um, the world famous uh, philosopher, Yogi Berra. You know, it's like deja vu all over again. So if you, um, you know, we're kind of worst to first to worst to, uh, we hope, first again uh, next year. The, um, so it's interesting, when you work for a World Series um, organization, especially joining when I did in the summer of last year, the... Um, you know, what's fascinating about it is it, it makes you kind of reflect a little bit. And you think about the Red Sox last year weren't the team that was the team of destiny per se. They weren't the team that everyone thought was going to necessarily win the World Series. But they were a really close-knit group. And they were, you know, we kind of mo tried to model that within our own technology organization. And so we kind of asked ourselves, you know, would we be considered a championship caliber IT organization? Um, and I think the answer is no. And, and, I, and there's probably very few organizations that can probably answer yes to that. But for us, it kind of put us on a little bit of a path, a journey, if you will, to, you know, how do we get to a better place, and, and how do we sort of hopefully sort of, you know, mimic sort of the behavior of a, a winning championship organization. So these were the, the six pillars upon which we kind of started 2014. They, um, they're important in the sense of, I'm only going to talk about a few of these because it would take too long to get into all the details. But the point I want to bring to your attention is, so for me, it was kind of aligning the organization for success. I mean, it kind of goes without saying. But, um, but obviously it was paramount. Improve customer service, better key business systems, create a more compelling um, fan experience. The, um, for those that have been to Fenway, Fenway is really like a living museum. So it's, it's a very different experience. And I'll, I'll tell you briefly about that when I talk about some of the, our fan base and, and so why they come to Fenway, because it's not traditional in terms of how other fans view um, baseball clubs. Um, obviously baseball, I spend a lot of my time with the baseball organization. Um, looking at ways that we can optimize their performance, um, statistics, analytics, and things like that. So we're trying to take that to a whole new level. And then lastly, sort of data, and data not just as it pertains to ballplayers and statistics and analytics, but also as it pertains to our customers. So these were uh, uh, the pillars, if you will. Those three pillars, and these ones I'm going to kind of try to come back to um, a few times today. So three things I want to bring to your attention. First one is understanding our customers, our fans. Um, these are going to be my themes, if you will, as I kind of walk through this discussion with you uh, today. So we struggle a little bit understanding our customers. And, and one of the reasons for that, and you might be surprised, I was, you know, as sort of a lifelong fan, but not somebody close to the organization. You know, before Bobby Valentine came to the uh, Red Sox in 2012, um, there was a five-year waiting list for um, season tickets. And so to a large extent, one of the things that happened is the organization became a little bit complacent. Um, you know, why go out there and try to, you know, 
find, you know, make, make the best possible experience, if you will, in certain cases? Why sort of invest in a lot of technology? Why really double down on the value of data and things like that when basically you have all these fans coming in year after year type of thing? Well, that all came to a crashing halt. And when it did, it was kind of really kind of an epiphany. It's an epiphany that, you know, that this, this organization could be more and that they, they could do a lot of the things um, that would kind of make it a more successful organization, not just financially and hopefully not just on the field, but also with a fan base. And, um, and the CEO uh, of the Red Sox, Larry Lucchino, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of CEOs. And um, by far, by far, the, the CEO who is the most, um, I'll say sort of like thoughtful about the fan. Um, the fan experience, the way we kind of think of it, starts when you kind of leave your house and ends when you get home. And, um, and it's something that he really kind of preaches internally quite a bit. So um, we kind of use this as an opportunity to kind of help sort of align our vision. Secondly, finding, attracting, and retaining talent. It doesn't matter whether you're in middle Georgia, you're in Atlanta, Boston, or other parts of the country. Finding quality talent is really, really difficult. And I'm going to tell you about sort of our journey, my journey, in just a short amount of time. I learned a lot of things at the Weather Channel, and one of them is, is how to sort of, you know, attract, retain, and sort of find talent. And I'll share with you what we're doing um, at the Red Sox, in part because it touches Georgia. Um, we rely on Georgia for a lot of the skills that we need to kind of do what we do at the Red Sox. And lastly, leveraging data and technology to support customers and realize success. That success obviously being a combination of financial success, but also obviously kind of winning championships. So those are the principles by which we're going to sort of whoops, try to operate here. All right. First, if you will, just a little bit of background. So when I started, you know, part of the thing I was really excited about is the marketing folks had just completed the segmentation analysis. And, and it gave us an insight into who are our customers. And you'd be surprised, but... For companies that haven't done this, it, it, it actually refuted a lot of things that we actually kind of thought about our fan base. You know, the one thing about Red Sox fans, especially these are Red Sox fans who happen to be local to about the Boston area, is that 7.2 million or 65 percent, two-thirds of the, of the population consider themselves Red Sox fans. That's a big, big number um, for people who just, you know, live in a general, you know, geographic area. And so what we wanted to do is understand that number. And so, so the, there are a couple categories um, of our fans that I want to kind of bring to your attention. This guy here is Dave, you know, and um, you know I'm a pretty I'm a pretty devoted fan. I'm not probably quite as excitable as Dan, you know, Dave, excuse me, but um, but Dave is a lifelong Red Sox fan. You know, loves the team. It, it's very serious business type of thing. Don't you know? Don't mess with Dave when he's trying to like watch the game type of thing. And, um, but Dave's of, of, for the Red Sox represent a really important category. There's a lot of Dave's. There's a lot of kids who go to college, you know, in the Boston area, and a lot of them stay. And, and we have to sort of cultivate this relationship, if you will, with sort of, you know, younger generation that continues to sort of become Red Sox fans for life. So Dave is one of the fans. I, I mentioned he's 10% of our total fan base. He, he disproportionately represents a significant portion of our ticket um, sales, if you can imagine. The next category I'm going to talk a bit about... Um, is family-focused Fran. And so, you know, I probably represent this category now, except with a couple more kids. And, the, um, and so going to a game at Fenway Park is a, um, it's a bit like I said before, going to a museum. It's a little bit like going to Disney World. And so for a lot of our fan base, coming to a game a year, maybe going to two games potentially, represents a big, big deal. It's a big investment for them. Um, it's also sort of experientially something you want to get right. Because like going to Disney World, if you have a bad experience, you kind of rethink the whole amount of effort it takes to kind of do it. It's a lot like that with sort of our fan base. So understanding these two categories, one of the things we embarked on, <laughs> embarked on, like stall here, there it goes, is um, understanding sort of our fans to a much greater degree. So we embarked on a very comprehensive customer data warehouse effort on our side to understand sort of what are all the touch points, if you will, to our fans. Now, this is very kind of common. A lot of companies do this. We're not breaking any real ground here, except that we now have a much better understanding of our fan base. We're not there yet. We've got an implementation coming up in December, another one coming up in January. So we've got a lot of releases coming up. But what it does for us is it affords us the opportunity to kind of better understand, you know, Fran and Dave and some of the other classes of our customer base, as well as to be able to develop programs to support them. And I'm going to take you through some of those because it might not be kind of what you might expect when you think about a baseball team. As, as I kind of move a little bit away for just a moment from the, understanding the customer to understanding sort of our challenge with um, resources. 
You might think like, wow, you're in the Northeast, there's a lot of access to colleges, you know, young talent, you know, um, a lot of entrepreneurial activity and whatnot. Well, how difficult can it be to find people? Uh, and the answer is difficult. Um, but what we set upon initially is understanding sort of like what is our talent gap? And this is something I, I did a lot at the Weather Channel and something that we kind of carried on at the Red Sox. But, you know, what do we cork at our core knowledge, core competency want to be known for? We've got deep baseball knowledge. We've got um, people like Bill James or people who watch Moneyball and things like that who works with us. We've got a gentleman who sits out in front of my office who, who is a, um, went to Harvard and then went to Columbia. And um, he does in analytics, baseball analytics, and, I, and I, I think we pay him like 10 bucks an hour or something. I don't know. He's, but he, um, he's really into it. And, and so we have a lot of these analysts who, who really spend a great deal of time crunching data. Um, we have software development, data analysis, and obviously traditional IT operations. Um, it's not easy supporting Fenway Park, supporting a 100-year-old 100, facility that was not designed for you know, IP-based kind of environments type of thing. So there's a, there's a handful of challenges in doing that. And then, so what's the next phase for us is, how do we then sort of extend our support environment so that we can then sort of do a better job of supporting all of our different uh, initiatives? And that's what that outer ring represents. And I, and I'm, I carve it out, I show it this way a little bit because I'm gonna talk about it in a second. But whether it's data or CRM or call centers or tier one support, UI design, I'm gonna skip baseball for a second, admin support or Wi-Fi design, all these things are areas that we look for outside of our own individual kind of core competencies at the club. And so baseball, by the way, I should just pause there for a minute. Major League Baseball and Major League Baseball's advanced media organization are, um, are two groups that, that really kind of are a byproduct or a part and parcel in some respects of the clubs. So the clubs obviously work very closely with baseball on everything from video to statistics to digital assets and that type of thing. And so I really kind of see them as being sort of um, a part of our solution space. So th keep this in mind. So this is sort of our talent gap that we're sort of, um, um, there it is. All right, so there's where we are, right? So in the upper northeast United States, you know, obviously maybe the epicenter for number of colleges in the area, um, obviously very high tech and whatnot. And so you would think again that access to talent would not be our biggest problem. There's a huge, huge demand there. But even if there weren't, if I were having this exact same conversation about this area, you know, access to talent is probably the most important thing that we need to develop, you know, core competency around. And it's something I spend a lot of my time thinking about. So despite the fact that we're, we're in sort of this epicenter, if you will, of colleges, you know, one of the challenges is they're not always cost effective, right? So I, the challenge fundamentally is, is how do I find the talent I need at the price that's reasonable, I'll say, that I want to pay? And so what we've sort of moved toward is this kind of point, like, you know, where do you fish for talent? Uh, we did a lot of this at the Weather Channel, but, but at the Red Sox, we've kind of taken it um, probably to new levels, at least in my, my short tenure there. So we, spent, we looked at Georgia um, for a number of our resources. And um, let me give you an example of what that looks like. So today, these are just some of the positions that we currently um, uh, have relationships, if you will, with companies and individuals within the Georgia area that supplement um, our current staff um, at the Red Sox. And so if you look at this map, so call center tier one support, um, every call from every major league baseball scout, um, every internal call that goes out, um, day, even if we have day of game calls and things like that, those all route through here. Um, we use a company called One Path, it used to be called TTI, um, I believe they're in Lawrenceville. They, um, we also use them at the Weather Channel, but they now take virtually all of our calls, they do take all of our calls, I should say. Um, they do tier one support, they route anything from tier two to us type of thing. We developed a bit of a sort of a SWAT team kind of approach towards sort of more significant problems, especially day of game problems. And, um, and they've done a fantastic job and it's, and it's been transformational. You know, give you some question here, like I didn't realize this and I'm pretty into baseball. Like how many scouts do you think are on a traditional, like, like a club like the Red Sox? How many, how many professional scouts are out there scouting for new talent? Any guesses? 15? six, there's, there's about a hundred. Um, and, and those scouts are scouts around the world. Um, and so, as you can imagine, it's kind of funny, when I, when I got there, I, we have a lot of scouting applications. We spent a lot of our time um, talking about scouting technology and systems and how to make that process better and how do you find great prospects, right? Because fundamentally, that's kind of what the future is all about for us. And it's interesting, but like, you know, I'm like, well, what happens when they call on the weekend? And, and guess what? That's tends to be the time they work, right? When they're like watching games and things. 
And they're like, oh, yeah, we, we get back to my Monday. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't seem too good. So we, um, so we kind of moved to this model, and it's worked fantastic. Um, they tend to staff also with someone who's um, Spanish-speaking. So we have a lot of scouts that are in sort of the, um, you know, Central America and the Caribbean area as well. And so um, that's been a big, big boom for us. The, um, a, a lot of our, all of our UI design for all of our systems, we pass through um, uh, an, an individual, actually, who lives here in Georgia, who does all of our design work. We just don't, everyone knows him, it's just this Frankie. And he does a fantastic job for us. We do mobile design work down here, so all of our prototyping for a lot of our different things, I'll talk more about that in a moment, um, happens here as well. A virtual admin, you know, I, I've got, um, I, when I went up there, I, I didn't have an admin, and for those that have known me for many years know that I desperately need an admin. And, um, and so my, my former administrative assistant was kind enough to uh, continue to work for me in sort of a remote fashion. So she's virtual to me from Boston. She's actually a, she's not like a hologram or anything. She's actually here. So you can touch her and things. But she's, um, it's fantastic to actually get a chance to kind of work again with her. And then lastly, software engineering. We, um, I know a lot of people here in Georgia. And, um, and we tap into them for a lot of the development work that we do um, at the Red Sox. So, it's, um, so we're very dependent upon Georgia. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we do that because that is, you know, something that equally applies to all of you. I mean, I'm further away than you guys are to some of this talent. And so the question sometimes is how do you find it and how do you cultivate it and how do you work with these kinds of folks and things like that. Um, you know, so this is about finding talent. Let me, let me talk about baseball for just a second. People know who this is? This is um, make them like this. Here, people know who this is. Come on. <laughs> so you probably know more from like Moneyball. He's, he's better looking on the right, but he's still a good-looking guy, you know. And so, so this is Billy Bean. Billy Bean is the general manager of the Oakland Athletics, and um, and, and very much thought of as really the pioneer of baseball analytics, um, together with like Bill James, who who works for the Red Sox, and. Um, and this is a quote from him, and I, and I think it's a great example. This is just a couple of months ago, actually, when, this, um, when he said this quote. It was in the Wall Street Journal in 2014, obviously. So increased demand for technical skills required to interpret the big data will dramatically change the composition demographics of the front offices. You know, baseball is an interesting um, environment. For those that don't understand sort of how baseball works on the inside, and I, from for one, did not, um, when I interviewed there, Someone asked me a question. I had all these interviews, and I thought they went pretty well. And someone said, well, uh, who do you know in baseball? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know anybody in baseball. You know, and someone's like, wow, you got this far without knowing somebody in baseball. So as it turned out, my, um, the owner of our, our, the Weather Channel before actually was roommates with Larry Lucchino, which was good. I didn't know that. So that sort of came in handy. But the, um, as it turns out, though, so data is growing exponentially. When you talk about big data when it comes to baseball, I would contend it's not very big data today. That's all about to change. But it's, when I think of like where I've come from with weather and trying to do that around the world, real time and things, that was really big data. Baseball, there's 162 games, not counting, you know, uh, playoffs and that type of thing. There's 30 clubs. It's kind of manageable numbers, I think, in the big scheme of things. But as I said a moment ago, as, as analysis it continues to sort of evolve and as, as patrons, as fans, we continue to look for more and more information that we get accustomed to, whether it's through football or other sports, um, baseball is trying to keep tempo, keep pace with that thing. So, so I know everything about, you know, um, what happens in almost real time in a given game. So that, this, this little example, I'm just going to whip through a few of these examples to show you, but this example here is the release point of a pitcher, right? So, so we actually know where the, the particular pitcher releases the ball. We know how many rotations the ball takes before it either hits the bat or hits a catcher's glove. Right, so you can, you can discern certain things from this from basically, you know, when he's pitching at his peak versus kind of when he sort of might be struggling or how many innings he's gone and that type of thing. And so there's an awful lot to be gleaned, if you will, from understanding space ball data. I mean, you've seen these before, but obviously this is sort of like, you know, this is sort of a bit of a hit, you know, map, if you will, in terms of where the pitch results are going. So we know how a pitcher is pitching. We know kind of where they're throwing the ball. We know what they tend to do on certain counts. Um, what you may not know, and I didn't realize this, is is for those that don't know, one of the interesting things about baseball is that you're not allowed to have electronics in the dugout. What you are allowed to do, however, is you, you can have electronics like right behind the dugout. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. It's probably something that dates back to Abner Doubleday or something or other. But anyways, if you go behind the dugout, we actually have a system called BATS. And, and BATS, what it does is it'll replay 
you can literally say, show me every at bat against this particular hitter, this pitcher, pitcher, excuse me. So David Ortiz, when he gets up and say, say he struck out, he might go into that dugout, go behind there, take a look at the video, take a look at the pitches, take a look at sort of what was thrown to him, and then obviously adjust the next time he goes up there type of thing. This kind of goes on all the time. So there's a constant learning process that's kind of taking place. And so this is kind of traditional data. This is data that's been available now for a few years. Um, it's not massive in its quantity, but it's insightful in terms of its information. The, um, there it goes. So, so here's how we use it, too. And this may not be as obvious to folks. Like, this is a, I've been talking about David Ortiz, but this is a David Ortiz. So David Ortiz hurt his wrist, right? So the upper left-hand picture there reflects kind of, you know, here's David Ortiz's hit spray chart, if you will, you know, before he hurt his wrist. And so you can see that he hits a lot of home runs to right field, a lot of deep balls to right field. He's a big pull hitter. If you ever watch him bat, you know, people do tend to shift a, a shortstop over into the second base area type of thing against him. After he hurt his wrist, this is what it looked like. Right? So, you know, sometimes you're at home and you're watching a game, you're kind of wondering why someone's struggling and things like this. You know, these little things like, you know, wrist injuries and other sort of things have a tr dramatic effect upon sort of ball placement and things. And all these go into play when people are thinking about sort of how do you position yourselves against these particular hitters and things, um, as well as sort of, so if you take a look at this, you can see he almost gets no balls to right field with a bad wrist because he can't get around fast enough because it hurts too much. And it's really kind of fascinating. So, so all this is analyzed on a regular basis. Um, it's also used for us to allow us to kind of think about who might be some of the prospects that we're particularly interested in, who might be good candidates for trade, things like that. Um, medical. This is an area that's growing exponentially. Um, for those that are familiar with sort of what occurred during sort of this year's you know, draft, amateur draft, um, a picture was taken from California, right? So, and that almost never happens. You almost never take a picture out of high school and, and with the first pick. And there's a reason for that. It's because that kid has to have so much potential that he's better than every kid in college, every single kid that's in instructional league and single A and double A and triple A and everything, all the way until you get up to sort of, you know, the majors. And they, anyways, they did this. And, um, you know, and one of the challenges in baseball, unlike football, where they had their combine, is that there isn't really a process in place that allows you to sort of do everything you'd like to do necessarily medically. And so... Long story short, when they did some MRI examinations, um, and they didn't release all the results, but it had a dramatic effect of this, and they pulled back sort of a lot of their, their offer, um, or changed their offer to this particular um, kid. And, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's rippling through the rest of baseball. So medical is becoming a huge deal. Not just to understand sort of physiologically sort of, you know, how this kind of works, but also, you know, psychologically. How does somebody respond in sort of pressure situations, you know? So there's behavioral psychologists um, that kind of deal with some of this information as well. All this information is all relatively new. This didn't exist. Kind of people weren't tracking all these different things. And some of the challenges that when you watch other sports, whether it's football or other sports, you, know, you see some of these behavioral problems or issues, you know, exhibit themselves. All sports, I'm just picking on baseball obviously, but all sports are now sort of rethinking a lot of this and rethinking sort of like what is the character of this person, you know, what's their makeup, you know, beyond just the physiological issues which are, which are obviously daunting. Um, and so I made the comment a moment ago that, that baseball's going through a, um, a transition. It's going through a real transition to big data. And, and I kind of hate that word big data. It's really overused. But, but it's only relative, relevant in sort of pointing out the fact that the magnitude is, is, is actually getting daunting. And so what's happening is we have the new release of what we're calling StatCast. And for those that watch maybe like the Home Run Derbies or most recently watching the World Series, we've now sort of, you know, Major League Baseball has installed StatCast cameras in, in a number of fields across the country. Those are, hope their goal is to have that all done by the end of, uh, in time for opening day next year. But the key thing there is that every 15th of a second, I now get a snapshot of what's going on in the field. So imagine the field being made up of a big matrix, a big grid. You know, I know every single data point on that grid every 15th of a second. So I know where every single player is, I know where the umpires are, I know where the ball is. So what that means is that when I get that information, I know exactly by the time the ball struck the bat, I, I know obviously the elevation of the, the trajectory, if you will, of sort of the ball. You know, I know how long it took for that center fielder, let's say, to sort of make their first movement to their left to try to catch the ball. You know, we used to say things like, oh, he got a good jump. <laughs> well, those things are very qualitative things, you know, that we used to get kind of very comfortable with. Those are all about to become all quantitative things, you know. So there's a tremendous amount of information that's now starting to flow. And it has interesting effects. If you look at sort of, again, Billy Bean's comment here, his point is it's not just kind of about professional sports, but youth sports. You know, these camera models are going to be everywhere before long. 
you know, and so it, it provides you with insight and information that you never had before, <laughs> good or bad. Um, give you an example. So when you look at things like this, when you watch like you know, Home Run Derby or something like that, you know, you start to see something. It didn't just go 116 feet. It won 116.7, you know, and that's, you know, someone, you know, obviously that's important to someone who's trying to keep or hit a record or something, but, um, but it also means that you know things like this. What's somebody's max speed? What's their acceleration around the bases? You know, it gives inside information to, like, you're a third base coach and you're trying to make a decision as to whether or not to advance the runner coming around second. You know, it gives you some sense for understanding these new metrics more than just sort of kind of qualitative information that we've used for the last 100 plus years. You know, what, I just mentioned 100 plus years. The one thing that's amazing is that when you talk about baseball and statistics, and baseball has so much information you can't even imagine. We have statistics that go back to, like, I think it's 1870. And, um, and I was talking to somebody the other day, I'm like, is that really relevant? And he's like, well, you know, you know if you're 6'3", and he's, there's a guy in you know, 1870 hit, I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, I guess it's relevant. You know, so it's, um, it's interesting how much information there is in baseball. Whoops. So that's data in baseball, and that's all great, right? And we all have our own sort of data challenges, and, and it's obviously data is becoming a, a differentiator for many of our companies. Um, in addition to that, though, we spend a lot of our time taking a look at emerging technologies. Um, Google Glass is just a simple example that everybody understands, I think. But, but obviously, you know, we more and more will start feeding that information, if you will, to fans and things like that. The challenge, obviously, is, is providing sort of a fan-friendly sport, if you will, so that people feel sort of like they can kind of go to the game, like, say, at Fenway, um, enjoy the game for kind of what they like about it without turning it into sort of a, too much of a digital circus. And so the challenge in that we struggle with sometimes is, is how to most effectively do that. Um, another good example here is we spend a lot of time looking at different things, different kinds of technologies to make them a little bit more fan friendly. This is just a simple example of sort of different kinds of camera technology that we now put up. Um, we have applications that we develop, mobile apps in the ballpark that we are looking to launch for opening day, hopefully, that, that now tell you sort of like what the wait line is at every single restroom or at concession stands. Um, and things like that. And so you can now start to like get to points where you can pull up an application, you can sort of see what the lines are, and it might even say, oh, you know, you might want to go to one on the left because it's significantly shorter. What it also does for us, though, behind the scenes, is we take all that information and all the video, and we store all of it, right? And what it does for us from an operational perspective is it gives us a chance to understand the flow of people throughout the park over, during the course of a game, two hours before the game to an hour after the game. And so we start to be able to kind of inform sort of our thinking in terms of how to create a more effective fan experience. Social media. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I mean, I think everyone here realizes the growth of social media. The only point is, is that 50, 50 to 60% of all of the wireless usage on a given, in a given stadium um, tends to be around social media. And so there are unique opportunities, obviously, to kind of tap into that and sort of create, hopefully, a, a better experience for fans and things. You know, in baseball, it's a little bit different. We work very closely with, with baseball's advanced media group um, in terms of developing, partnering, I should say, because they do the developing, in this case, um, applications that allow us to sort of leverage things like social media in other areas. But as social media obviously kind of continues to grow, you know, one of the things that we're doing with Fenway, so by opening day next year, at least probably 28 of the 30 clubs will now have public-facing Wi-Fi in Major League Baseball. Um, it's a big deal, obviously, and so that is really sort of seen really as the ante, right? How do we put infrastructure in place that allows fans to have, you know, access to their business, you know, information, allows them to kind of do more effective, you know, use of social media and things, and allows us to be able to sort of hopefully provide them with a better experience um, through various kinds of concierge services and things. Come on, baby. Oh, I can't tell if I went too far, let me see. So these are the two primary applications that are used in baseball. Um, they're both sourced by the Major League Baseball's advanced media organization. Um, each club has the ability to sort of customize their own respective areas. But these are the two apps that, for those that are in baseball you know, at bat, as well as sort of the, um, at the ballpark application um, that most people use. At, at bat obviously tells you pitch by pitch kind of thing. The other one tells you about amenities and other sort of capabilities within the park, et cetera. Um, the reason I pause here a little bit is I want to tell you is that like, we're spending a lot of time taking a look at sort of, so this is part of our journey. Our journey at the Red Sox has been, you know, how do we address some of the shortcomings that we have as an as a organization, areas that we know we can improve in? 
You know, one of them is to increase ticket sales where, when appropriate. You know, you know, part of it is digital ticket adoption or issuance of no tickets. You know, one of the challenges for the Red Sox is that, you know, as I mentioned before, when you come to a game, you know, at Fenway, it's a little bit like going to Disney World. And so people like to retain their ticket stubs as memorabilia. You know, a lot of baseball clubs have already moved to 100% digital ticketing. And so with digital ticketing, we can kind of do certain things that we can't do with, obviously, with a paper ticket and that type of thing. And so there's a movement in all sports right now trying to move to digital ticketing. And, you know, obviously we're kind of part of that process, albeit want to be, you know, receptive and responsible, if you will, to um, you know, our fan base in terms of how we do certain things. We also want to make sure that no tickets go unused. It's a big problem in sports, right? You, you know, sometimes, how many times have you watched a football game or any sport, for that matter, and they'll say, like, oh, it's another sold-out event, and, you know, when it's in, like, the first quarter or something, you know, you can see, like, it looks like it's about, like, 70% capacity, right? Those are vacancies, right? And, and so one of the challenges historically is there weren't good methods for being able to sort of transfer tickets and, and do other sort of things. I mean, the stub hubs and the ACE tickets and those guys try to fill some of that gap. Um, but it doesn't work nearly as efficiently as it could. And so there's a lot of discussion about how we can come up with a better method of either digitally, but digitally is really easy where I can kind of push my ticket to you um, and allow you to then sort of be able to sort of, you know, leverage sort of a, a ticket that would have obviously otherwise gone sort of unused. You know, the fan experience itself, this at the ballpark is an application that we use the, um, that tells you a bit about sort of our park, it tells you about the amenities and that type of thing. But it, it's, not as, it's not as widely adopted as we'd like it to be. And so we have a big effort next year um, to see what we can do to get the adoption levels up, if you will. We want to enhance the experience but not distract from it. You know, Finley Park, you know, someone who grew up there and went to, has gone to hundreds of games there probably, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a wonderful experience like I think all bar, ball parks are. And although we want to sort of leverage technology, we don't want to take away from all those things that make baseball as great as it is. And as I said earlier, uh, when I was mentioning Larry Lucchino, the, the fan experience spans before, during, and after the game. Um, as I said before, this is taken very seriously um, in our organization. Um, it's all about, you know, can you find the parking? Do you know how to get home? Do we give information to you to make it a, you know, an easy process? Do we kind of help you when you come in if you're not someone who comes in on a regular basis? That type of thing. So that's fan experience. I'm on. That's fan experience. Thank you. Um, fan engagement. You know, history and tradition is unique to Fenway. Um, we take it very seriously. You know, what fans care about most are access to players, moments, insider things. We have loyalty programs that we use at Fenway. Obviously, we give, we give certain um, loyalty members uh, the ability to, you know, watch batting practice, you know, sit in the green monster seats, um, upgrade tickets, uh, you know, redeem basically their loyalty points, no different than, let's say, Delta. Um, except within the ballpark and do different sort of things. And that's a huge hit within sort of um, our environment. You know, we're engaging with fans all year round, so we'll be making some announcements in the very near future about sort of, you know, some of the things that we're going to start to do off-season, you know, for those um, Red Sox fans that are here. And, um, and I think it's going to be try to carry a much more 360, you know, 365-day-a-year 360 day, day um, type of experience versus just baseball. I'll flip to next one. Um, Key audiences, I, I kind of mentioned Devoted Dave and Fran, family-focused Fran. The, um, you know, these are the two groups that we focus the most on. And, and I kind of mentioned them briefly because I'm going to show you kind of what we're trying to do for some of these folks. So next. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time on, this is something we did at the Weather Channel too, is we, we take a look at what's best in class, right? So, you know, in baseball, you know, how do we, the Red Sox, stack up against some of our peer group in the industry? You know, do we, do we have our act together? You know, how do we fail? You know, how do we do technically? I mean, do, how do we do operationally? That type of thing. One thing I didn't know, and something I suspect most of you probably didn't know, is that, you know, we're incredibly competitive on the field, but in the front office and behind the scenes, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very harmonious relationship between the clubs. You know, if you think about it, like, you know, as, as a, someone from the Boston Red Sox, I'm not competing for the fan base of the, of the Braves. Right, and so as a result of it, you know, I'll take give you an example. Like in November of this year, we're all going to go to Arizona. So every single club will send probably somewhere between four and six people in the technology organizations, you know, to um, Arizona, where we basically kind of share best practices. And so, you know, from a baseball perspective, I think what's great about it is is that, you know, we're all trying to become more efficient. We're all trying to learn from one another. We're all trying to raise the bar. So it's very, very different than traditional competitors, you know. On the field and when it comes to baseball analytics and operations, 
very, very competitive. So we don't, we don't share anything about baseball, you know, relative to sort of the science of baseball or how we basically do the job of baseball. But when it comes to the business of baseball, um, it's, it's a great relationship between the various clubs. We extend that to look at sort of best in class in sports. You know, um, Fenway Sports Group happens to own Liverpool Football Club. So I spend a lot of time with Liverpool folks understanding sort of what they do in soccer. Um, I know people at the Olympics group, and so we spend time with the Olympics or the Bruins or the Patriots or um, NCAA, or we had some discussions a little bit around sort of the World Cup. And so we're constantly looking for ways that we can improve ourselves. And obviously this is not unique to us. I mean, this is something that, you know, I've only been there 14 months, but this is something that we all need to do within our respective businesses in order for us to be competitive. You know, and then obviously we look at best in class. That 360 degree view of a fan um, it, it's not revolutionary, right? I mean, there's a lot of, lot of organizations that have been doing that for many, many years. It, it's relatively new in baseball. Um, and so we look at different sort of industries, whether it's like financial services or banking or insurance and other ones, medical, where they kind of have already kind of developed these things. And we kind of try to extend some of those best practices to some of our groups. I say all that because let me show you a little bit some of the things that we're thinking about. So as we think about sort of competitive landscape and we think about how we can get to a better place in baseball, and this is purely a Red Sox point of view, by the way. And some of this was done in partnership with one of our um, um, product engineering organizations, Sapient. But we start to take a look at sort of like, you know, who is best to breed in our minds in terms of some of the baseball things. San Francisco does a very nice job in, in the area of social media. So they have a social media cafe. So um, we thought that was so good, we ripped it off and did the same thing at Fenway, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, and so um, that's been a big hit at Fenway. We kind of hope they come up with something really good next, you know. <laughs> the, um, you know, the other thing is, you know, the Giants did a good job with digital ticketing. Um, we sort of already know all this, but, you know, there's a lot of dynamics around ticketing and a lot of complexity associated with the ticketing process. Um, we look at opportunities to create sort of now um, tiered pricing, uh, lower pricing for certain games, higher pricing for other games. Um, it varies, obviously, by the opponent and that type of thing. You know, it's also we try to move more and more towards digital wherever we can. So there's a, there's a move underway, and for those that attend games, we'll probably start seeing more of this in the next two years. One more. Thanks. Um, the Angels have a tablet rental process. So I mentioned, you know, fan-friendly Fran. You know, um, I think marketing people do that just to kind of screw me up. But they, um, you know, one of the things that they do is they provide this tablet for rental purposes to... Um, to patrons who come to their games, right? And so that's kind of, you might think, well, why would someone do that, right? Well, you know, if you're like me and you have four kids, albeit they're a little bit older now, three of them, the, um, you know, they're constantly looking sort of like, you know, I used to come to a lot of Braves games and I would, um, I'd either sort of like have to sort of plan my moments for like, do I get there early and leave? Like, do I have to leave early or do I get there in like the, the third inning and try to make it to the ninth? And so it was always sort of an experience because trying to get nine innings out of my kids was impossible, you know, frankly. And, um, and so anyway, so there's different ways that clubs are looking at of advancing these type of capabilities. Uh, next. As I said before, we look outside of just traditional sports. Tampa Bay Lightning, they use a RFID tag, you know, in jerseys that they make available, right? Um, it seems maybe a little bit big brother kind of thing, but what that does, without having to take things out of your wallet, you can now start to like exchange, you know, goods and merchandising and services and things like that by just wearing your jersey and things. And so there are a lot of things that people are looking at. You know, you hear the overused expression, Internet of Things, which is another expression I'm not too fond of. But, but if you think about that, like, you know, as, as more technology is sort of embedded within clothing and other sort of areas and things like that, machines and things, you know, it does provide a lot more information to all of us, obviously, and to you. Um, it allows us to kind of interact with it and hopefully in a sort of a format that's a little bit more conducive. The challenge is going to be doing all those things obviously in a format that's not going to be too like over the top, you know, and that's obviously the, the inherent challenge or trap associated with all of this. Uh, next please. So this is Sporting Kansas City. So this is a soccer club obviously, but if you look at this, this is live video streaming and replays. So in 2014, Major League Baseball launched Instant Replay. Excuse me. They, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion now that once you, every club essentially has public-facing Wi-Fi, we now have the ability to be able to promote and push new type of capabilities and technologies that were, weren't available previously. And so this is something that we're, um, we're looking at as, as ideas, if you will. So these are all, think of all these things as just sort of, you know, things that we sort of think of about um, in areas that we look to sort of 
hopefully sort of take advantage of in the near future. Uh, next. So Disney, I mean, you know, obviously this is, pe most people are aware of this, but these bands and things. So obviously, you know, that's a very creative model. Um, we're looking at it as well in terms of ways to kind of facilitate access around the park. Um, you know, another area kind of a little bit different than an RFID tag, but reminds me of it is, is um, sensors. So we now have these things we call iBeacons you know, spread around the park as well. And these iBeacons will alert you if you're in sort of proximity of different areas in the park. So to go back to sort of taking sort of the fan friendly, Fran's family for a minute, it's a tongue twister. The, um, you know, one of the things that can happen is that one of the challenges we have in Boston and a lot of the northern clubs is, is the weather, and, and especially in April and May. I mean, two things happen. You know, kids aren't out of school yet, which is a problem, you know, at least for, you know, having sellouts. And, um, and the weather is, you know, uh, very unpredictable. And so one of the challenges there is like, you know, so, the, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I brought my kids to games where it's like poured. And there's like nothing worse than like, you know, having a bunch of little ones where it's raining outside and they're just, you know, they want to leave and things like that. So we're kind of looking at within Fenway at opportunities where maybe we'll do things like digital scavenger hunts and things like that, um, where you can kind of, you know, collect certain sort of memorabilia and things like that electronically, you know, around the ballpark and that type of thing. So you can sort of see, my only reason bringing this up is that we're rethinking the way we do baseball, not just baseball for statistics. That's, that's kind of a given. I mean, we're obviously going to continue to sort of advance the science of baseball, the access to the data, you know, the decision-making processes, and, and work obviously with the athletes to try to get the, the maximum uh, amount of capabilities out of them. But it's also about the fans, and it's about understanding things, and a lot of it, you know, people sometimes feel like sometimes it's a big distraction, all this, you know, data and information and people sort of, you know, trying to uh, learn more about them and things. And, and, I'm, and I, people do go overboard with it, but there are also a lot of opportunities to try to create a, a better experience, if you will, and something that we're trying to uh, do on a regular basis. Um, it, it doesn't extend itself just to sports or to media and things. You know, this is just another example, but a very different one. But you know, you can kind of drag art from a digital wall to their tablets. So we kind of think about that and think about maybe some kind of form of augmented reality technology, right? So do we provide some kind of augmented reality technology within Fenway, you know, provide historical information around, you know, landmarks and things? You know, we, we literally, one of the things that somebody was showing an example to me recently was is, you know, you can kind of look through a set of binoculars around Fenway and it'll show you what it looked like in different eras of the, um, the ballpark. So you can look and see like what the skyline looked like if I were to like look through something, you know, um, and, and say I've set it for like, you know, 1942 type of thing. So very different. And, and so all these things, you know, combined basically form so the nucleus of sort of our challenge, which is how do we advance, you know, how do we understand our customers so we can create the technologies that we can learn from our competitive landscape, that we can sort of make our players more effective and obviously higher performing. And also get the best results for both sort of the fans as well as sort of for the results of the club. Next. And, oops, I'm sorry, I went too far. So, so again, going back to my sort of three themes for just a minute. Um, understanding our customers. We spend a lot of time at this. We, we really want to understand our customers. Historically, we had a pretty limited access and understanding of them. We made a lot of assumptions. Um, and many of those were kind of erroneous, frankly. The, um, you know, we want to find, attract, and retain talent. Um, and I can talk more about this, and obviously we'll take questions in just a few minutes, but the, um, you know, talent is something that we spend a great deal of time on. Um, you know, one of the challenges in that example I pose, but these are overcomable challenges, are things like, you know, how do you communicate with some of these folks? Like if I've got teams in Georgia and I've got teams in Boston, you know, how do they work together and things like that? So we do things like Google Hangouts, we do Skype sessions, we do, you know, we obviously, we obviously have connected all of our connectivity together so that, you know, all phone calls kind of ring like just as if you were there type of thing. And so we make it a very seamless transition. You know, I happen to be kind of picking on Georgia a little bit since we're here. I'm picking in a positive sense, but, it, but I, I kind of, you know, went to this model in part because, you know, I know a lot of people here. Um, you know, it's a very business friendly culture. You know, it's a, um, it's cost effective. You know, people that are here like it here, and, and they don't want to leave. And so, you know, trying to find people who are happy and comfortable in their surroundings, yet highly productive in their abilities. You know, there's good colleges here. And so, um, so we feel like we're kind of making an investment, um, and it's paid off very, very well for us. So we feel very good about it, and I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more of it. And lastly, this leveraging digital the data and technology. 
Oops, sorry, more for a second. But it's, it's okay. <laughs> the, um, the data technology, I mean, obviously it's to drive success of the company um, as well as winning championships. And, um, and so obviously the science becomes a big deal for us. So, you know, I think as our own organizations, you look at your own organizations, I mean, I would, I would challenge you, you know, when you're talking to your own technology folks, whether you're here or, or they're not here, you know, to sort of like look outside traditional processes. I mean, you know, the pursuit of talent is only going to get more challenging in the future, right? And, and so it's time to sort of adopt, you know, certain certain cases, maybe what you might consider non-traditional models. Um, and I know for a lot of companies it makes them uncomfortable. You know, um, and honestly, you know, sometimes when I think of experiences that we've had in farming certain things out in the past, maybe in India or other places, we had very, very mixed results over that. However, what it did for us, though, is it taught us kind of how to operate sort of, for, you know, in a distance kind of relationship type of thing. Um, the one thing I just would point out to you, though, and I, and I think you guys, this is sort of intuitive perhaps, but, you know, what it also does, though, it puts a premium on the quality of leadership and management. You know, if you can't manage somebody who's sitting in the cube next to you, well, you're going to do a really poor job and it's 3,000 miles away, right? Um, and, so, and so it's something to think about. It's not, you know, it's not like one of those kind of Rolodex things where you just kind of, you know, look it up, find a good talent, and then sort of, you know, connect them to your business type of thing. You know, it requires a real kind of process, if you will, to be effective. And, um, and, and I think we've been, you know, very happy with sort of the relationship that we've developed kind of and cultivated with some of the talent here in Georgia. And, um, and I appreciate you guys all having me here. So.